I want to start, actually, firstly, by thanking um, the Irish government, my good friend and colleague, Brendan, who runs the development cooperation effort here, and also you, sir, at the Institute, for giving me an opportunity to have this discussion with you. Um, it's always uh, great to come to uh, Dublin, but particularly for me in my professional capacity now, because over the 27 years I've been working in aid and development, one of the partners with which we've had the strongest relationship always, especially at the country level, um, has been Ireland. And I think this is a really important moment as we uh, shape together the future set of goals and the way we achieve goals on international development uh, for both Ireland, with your presidency coming forward uh, on the EU, and for the UK with the set of things we're involved with in shaping the future. So we've had a really fantastic day of uh, talks today between the two governments on how we're going to work together in that period ahead. Um, Ireland has consistently been, uh, for the last... Uh, uh, several years, one of the most generous uh, providers of development assistance, and Irish aid has acquired uh, an impressive reputation globally. My very good friend, I'm going to ask Simon, my colleague, to to pass it uh, up to me. Up to to me, my very good friend Ronan Murphy, who uh, used to uh, do Brendan's job, did a fantastic uh, a job in in telling the story of Irish aid. You'll see that my copy is extremely well thumbed. <laughs> we have learnt a lot from the way you've developed your program. Uh, I'm not on commission for this, but, but if I were, I would be advocating to you even more strongly. If you haven't read this story, it's a story that should make every Irish citizen proud of the contribution um, you have played to global development and improving the state of the world. And certainly in the UK, where we've also tried to improve in recent years, we think we've learnt a lot from you. I think um, I know the government is in the um, process at the moment of finalising a new white paper on aid and development. I can tell you that we in the UK will be studying very carefully the judgments and the decisions you reach. Um, and I think it's uh, very timely for you to be going through that policy making process. But I also know that um, this issue of uh, aid and development has been a matter of some controversy here over the recent period, partly because of the economic challenge, partly because of, of some of the cases you've um, had to deal with in the very recent past. And basically what I would like to do um, this afternoon is set out what I think the core case for support for international development <coughs> is during a time of downturn. Um, and I would also like briefly to touch on um, how we deal with problems when they arise and uh, uh, you know, solve the challenges we, we meet. We, we hear, and I know you had a, a recent um, national conversation on aid, um, we hear that although there is still very high levels of public support for aid and development, I saw one poll from here indicating that 80% of your citizens continue to support the priority you give to this. We also hear lots of um, criticisms and critiques. And basically, I would like to try and address the main critiques we hear in the UK, respond to them, and ask whether um, that, that line of attack and that, that, that set of responses resonates um, at all with you here. The first line of attack on support for international development um, is that efforts to promote development are always doomed to failure. Actually, that's an attack we used to hear a lot in the 70s and 80s, but we don't hear nearly so often now. Because, actually, of course, the last few decades have seen extraordinary progress on development goals of a sort that was, uh, it was impossible to contemplate three or four decades ago. Uh, in the um, mid-1990s, as a lowly official in what was then the Overseas Development Administration, I was occasionally tasked by my then permanent secretary with writing briefing papers for him to take off to the um, OECD in Paris to discuss with his counterparts the state of global development and the future goals. <clears throat> and these... Um, great men, because they were always, unfortunately, men in those, those days, would go into this um, 
uh, rather dark um, dungeon-like basement in an unattractive 1960s concrete office block in Paris and have their discussions. And those discussions ultimately led to the agreement of the international development targets, which in turn were largely adopted in the United Nations as the Millennium Development Goals. Now, at the time, the development of this set of targets was regarded as a rather racy proposition. The idea that um, it would be possible to halve global poverty, to send every child to school, to reduce by three-quarters the number of women dying in childbirth, to reduce by two-thirds the number of children dying before their fifth birthday, all by 2015. The idea of doing that in 1990 was regarded, frankly, as pie in the sky. And, of course, what we now know is that many of the targets have been achieved. The halving global poverty target was achieved five years early. The um, target to do with providing access for more people to water and sanitation was achieved five years early. Um, we have uh, made enormous progress in health and education with plummeting infant mortality and much better access to education. And these things have happened quite broadly across the world. This isn't just a story of China and East Asia. Since 2008, for the first time since records started to be kept, um, the proportion of people in Africa living um, below the extreme poverty line has been falling, and it's a minority of people now in Africa who are in the most extreme poverty. So there has been a lot of progress. Of course, not, not, not every target has been met, and you know the naysayers like to pounce on the targets that were set and, and weren't met. But the analogy I like for this is the, um, the analogy of the um, fictitious high jumper who says that against the current world record of 2 metres 45 centimetres, he is going to jump 4 metres. And in the end, what he jumps is 3 metres 50. So is that an appalling failure because he didn't meet his target, or is it a feat of exceptional brilliance? The second critique that we hear in the UK is that even if development has occurred, aid had nothing to do with it. And um, again, um, you know, that was a critique that was quite widely heard and is still heard to some degree, certainly in the UK. Um, and, you know, the truth is reasonable people can disagree on the precise linkages between aid and economic growth and poverty reduction because the, it is the case that there are many determinants of whether an economy grows and whether poverty is reduced. And aid in any environment is only a small part of the resource flow. Um, as it happens, I, you know, I'm trained as an economist and the best economists I know are reasonably satisfied that there is a positive causal relationship between aid and economic growth and poverty reduction. But it is, it's hard to specify precisely, and reasonable people can disagree about the precise determinants. But, but just think for a minute about a simpler test about the link between um, aid and the goals that aid is supposed to achieve. A decade ago, the global level of development assistance was about um, $60 billion a year. Now it's about $130 billion a year. Over that period, there has been exceptional progress on the sorts of things that aid is trying to do. So one of the reasons infant mortality has plummeted is that there is much better access to immunization and all the other set of interventions that stop children dying before their fifth birthday. Um, no one can deny the dramatic role aid has played in providing antiretrovirals to people whose lives would otherwise have been cut dramatically short by HIV and AIDS. No one really can deny the role that AIDS has played in financing an opportunity to go to school for tens of millions of extra children across most of Africa. In fact, of course, even the sceptics have stopped trying to deny the contribution AID makes to those goals. Um, what they try to do instead, I think, is identify a few of the failures of AID and leap to the conclusion that because some things have failed, everything is similarly afflicted. And the truth is that the development community has 
opened itself up to that line of argument because we haven't in the past invested nearly enough in monitoring and evaluation or focused enough on the results we do achieve with the resources we have. We've started to get better at that in recent years, generating more evidence on impact and the successes. And in doing that, we've achieved a kind of triple whammy. We have provided better evidence of our successes. That means we improve the quality of what we do, so we learn lessons. And we identify our failures better, so we're slightly less likely to repeat them time after time. And that investment in evidence and impact and results, I think, has been an important contributor to growing public support for um, aid and development as well. One of our leading uh, newspapers uh, in the UK set this out in an editorial uh, last month. This is a quote. Global AIDS has wiped out smallpox. It's controlled HIV and AIDS in 6 million people. It's put 46 million more children into school in the past two decades. And it will vaccinate one child every two seconds for the next five years. And when you tell people there is evidence to justify all that, that's one of the most powerful things you can do to sustain public support. The third line of attack we then hear in the UK is that even if developments happened and AIDS contributed to it, our problems now in Europe are so great that we can no longer be as generous as we used to be or as we promised we would be. Now, this critique is a little bit above my pay grade. Um, so let me tell you what, what David Cameron's response to this critique is. The first thing he says is, we made a promise. We have a moral responsibility to keep it. In the UK, you know, we're cutting public expenditure in almost every area, very dramatically in most, most areas of domestic policy. But we do attach importance to the commitment we made to reach the 0.7 target, which we will do next year. And we've decided that we're not going to balance our books on the backs of the poorest people in the world. The second thing David Cameron says is that it's in the UK's national interest to promote progress elsewhere. Prosperity in the developing world will create new markets for us. Stability in the reduction of conflict, which development brings with it, reduces the threats to us. Climate change is only going to be tackled with the engagement of the developing world. It's in our interest to help them grow and develop in a cleaner, greener way than we did. Similar considerations apply to um, concerns over asylum and migration, the threat of pandemics, the international war against drugs, and to things like illicit financial flows. The UK, I guess like Ireland, is an open economy and an open society. We can't build a wall to protect ourselves from threats elsewhere. So our only option is to help other countries tackle problems which, if they're not tackled, will affect us too. The fourth critique we hear is that aid organisations too often waste or misuse money. And, um, of course, there's a big current case uh, which you've been dealing with and which has the potential to draw us in as well um, in Uganda. I would like to say that I do admire very much the way the Irish government um, both here in Dublin and in Kampala, where my colleagues work very closely with their Irish colleagues, have been tackling this um, problem. I think you actually have led the dialogue with the government of Uganda on behalf of all of the um, donors. And I know you've had a promise from the government of Uganda that uh, you will be um, repaid. And I'm 100% confident, actually, that Irish taxpayers will end up not losing a penny through this exercise. Um, and I think that's really important where there is a fraud that the funds are recovered. That's a, that's a really fundamental part of the UK approach to dealing with fraud and corruption problems. I guess when you have a problem like this, there is bound to be a temptation to ask, well, would it be better just to avoid working through governments where there's risky systems and just to work through intermediaries like NGOs or others instead? I I'm not sure that that is the best response. Ultimately, every country has to try to develop its own 
systems and institutions. And one of the best uses of aid resources is to help with the development of those institutions, especially, actually, the institutions whose job it is to hold the wider system to account. So one of the things that we think is important in a country like Uganda is to provide support to the Auditor General. And maybe it's worth remembering that it was largely through the work of the Auditor General that the current problems were exposed in Uganda and to try to build up their ability um, to do that kind of job in future and to try to support the reformers in the system who want the corruption problem to be um, dealt with. In other words, how can we use problems of the sort that have been in Uganda to turn a crisis into an opportunity to accelerate the tackling of corruption and the improvement of the use of um, public resources? There are other examples given of the way in which aid can sometimes be wasted or misused. Um, we have had a lot of concern in the UK recently over the effectiveness with which multilateral organisations, the EU, the UN, the World Bank and the like, use resources we provide through them. Um, actually, um, I must say I share a lot of the frustration that many people have about um, multilateral expenditure but I would also say that the quality of that expenditure um, is improving. I think, um, well, well we, we are making big steps forward in, in improving our approach to securing value for money through multilateral organisations. I was going to say I think that, but in fact, that uh, form of words I've just used, big steps forward in improving value for money, was one that the Auditor General in the UK used about the UK's own approach to securing VFM in multilateral institutions. I had the um, important opportunity to exchange views with the UK's Public Accounts Committee on this discussion uh, on a uh, Wednesday afternoon three or four weeks ago. And they too, their job, like here no doubt, is to find the problems with public expenditure. But they too recognise that value for money through the multilaterals is improving. We've also in the UK had criticism recently about the way we use consultants and the idea that, um, you know, it's uh, um, questionable whether private sector consultants should be brought into um, the development business and providing their services under the aid programme. Um, maybe they're too uh, expensive or inefficient. Um, I think there are elements of that critique. I have some sympathy for, um, but it is important to unpack it. Technical capability is one of the core deficits of most developing countries. So, of course, they want to access professional services from places where there is more capability. Um, and the truth is that there's a lot more purchasing of professional services that's not funded by aid programmes uh, purchasing by developing countries from developed countries. And the idea that, you know, European businesses should be excluded from competing in that global market seems to me to be a slightly silly idea. That said, I think when we're, we're purchasing um, consultant services for developing country governments from our budget, we have to do two things really well. Firstly, we have to make sure we're getting services that are valuable, um, and I think often we do. You know, in Afghanistan, we have financed work by consultants, which has enabled that country to increase its revenue base from essentially nothing um, a decade ago to a billion dollars a year now. If, if Afghanistan wasn't raising that money in taxes, they'd be even more dependent on us than they already are. So it's in our interest to provide those sorts of services. I was in, to give another example, Nigeria um, last month, and there the head of the Presidential Commission on the Power Sector said to me that the value he had identified from DFID-supported consultants um, trying to improve the power transmitted through the grid and its uh, transmission and distribution was providing benefits to Nigerian uh, consumers more than, of more than a billion dollars a year. So I think there's lots of examples where technical assistance provided by consultants is high value. What we need to do, though, is make sure we buy those services at the cheapest possible price. And one of the things we've been saying to our own consulting companies is uh, you need to do a better job than you've done in the past at 
getting the price right, and we're going to build the competitive market so we can drive the prices down, and we're going to have more transparency of fee rates and contract costs so everybody can see what's being bought for um, what sum of money. Let me, let me draw this to a close. I've, I've tried really just to say a few things. The first thing is development works. The second thing is that aid contributes to development. The third thing is that our interests are promoted by securing progress elsewhere. Aid management has improved, even if there are um, steps we can still take to improve it further. Um, to paraphrase the British newspaper I referred to earlier, even in the most generous countries, it's still the case that aid is less than one cent in the euro of um, national income. And actually, most people in all our countries understand that. The, that editorial I quoted earlier went on to say, um, there's public support for aid. A 2010 poll found that 55% of Britons think we should keep our promises to boost aid, with just 27% saying we should cut it. And ordinary people vote with their wallets as well. We have um, annual events in the UK uh, like comic relief and sport relief, where the citizens of the country decide to vote with their own um, wallets on whether they want to contribute to these endeavours. And notwithstanding the economic crisis we've been through, the best ever year for fundraising for comic relief was 2011. Um, I um, attach a lot of importance, as I said earlier, to the collaboration we have with Ireland in shaping the future policy processes. We had a great event which the Taoiseach came to uh, at 10 Downing Street on the 11th of August, uh, the last day of the Olympics on food and hunger and resilience issues. David Cameron uh, was, was you know, really positive about that event. Um, it got a lot of publicity. Perhaps it was the Taoiseach and the Prime Minister who got the publicity. Perhaps it was also Mo Farah who may have helped a bit. But it was a popular event. Uh, I know the Irish uh, government are going through the presidency to have a similar event here in, in the spring of next year. And then we, as part of our G8 presidency, will also be pushing forward this um, food, um, nutrition set of issues. I think that's a great example of the way our two uh, countries can um, collaborate. One of the great poets once said, um, um, thinking about, you know, when is the right time to tackle problems? And this is what I feel about the development challenge we have. The poet said, if not now, when? And if not us, who? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.